everyone, good evening. Welcome to I Care For Your Brain with Dr. Karen Sullivan. That's me, board certified neuropsychologist. We are here to talk about another movement disorder. We have been focused on essential tremor for the last couple of weeks, mostly um, because we really identified a huge unmet series of unmet needs in that community and we put together a webinar a few weeks ago where we really tried to focus on the non-motor symptoms and really demystify people who live with ET what's going on in their brain what happens to them socially and what the emotional experience can be like with having ET so in the course of doing that work and getting to know that community better I started to get a lot of messages about OT and that is the topic of our lecture tonight and I have to tell you as I was doing the research for this lecture I felt more unsatisfied and unhappy with this body of literature than anything in all of brain health that I have studied in my entire career so that should make you feel validated in a sense if you live with OT because here I am your brain health expert trying to go out in all the special archives and the scientific journal articles and there is honestly just not that much out there so what I like to do hey Jerry what I like to do in these lectures is to educate empower and I always try to find things that even a, a great expert uh, who lives with it wouldn't necessarily know and I just feel like I, I just wanted so badly to come up with more for you all but this is my very best um, effort and I hope you learn something and I hope it makes you feel um, a little bit more understood so orthostatic tremor goes by a few names so we've got OT we've got POT and some people call it shaky leg syndrome it is hands down the most poorly understood, I would say the most um, poorly recognized, the most under-recognized, and probably the most invisible movement disorder. Compared to things like Parkinson's and essential tremor, that research is relatively dense and helpful, and like I said, just really could not find a lot within OT. The first time it gets talked about in the scientific community is only in the 1970s. This, this was an Italian researcher, and he basically came out and described the phenomenon, but but it wasn't until 1984 when Dr. Ken Heilman out of the University of Florida actually gave it the name orthostatic tremor. He is actually an amazing behavioral neurologist. I've had the pleasure of hearing him lecture on a number of occasions and he's really kind of the person who brought OT to the public awareness. And when we think of OT, it's characterized by some significant symptoms, but there's also so much more that's happening that not only is minimized in the literature, but I really feel strongly after doing this research that God willing, we are on in the absolute beginning phases of understanding OT as a cerebellar disorder. And if you've been watching me for a while, you know that I have a strong passion for the cerebellum, mostly because it's so poorly understood by most people and it gets, minimized as something that helps with balance and movement only. But part of what we know so well is that it also does things in your cognitive world and it does things in your emotional world. And we're gonna talk about those things tonight. The primary symptom though is a profound disabling sense of unsteadiness when someone is standing that is relieved when they sit, when they walk, when they lay down. The leg tremor is the most common type of tremor in this disorder, but we know that many people have tremor in different parts of their body too. So typically the way we think of it is it kind of spreads upward, which is an unusual progression for a movement disorder. The symptoms we know uh, decrease, like I said, when you start to walk, but also if you lean on something, so like hanging onto a person or hanging onto a wall. The way we know, the way we first started to know about the cerebellum and OT is by actually observing what we call gait pattern. And that's just simply when your neurologist asks you to walk up and down the hall. There's so much rich information that we get as brain doctors from watching someone walk. It's fascinating. So what we started to see is that folks with OT were managing their unsteadiness by spreading out their legs more, widening their stance. We also noticed from people's report that they were kind of clawing on the floor with their toes. And we know that this happens in other disorders where the cerebellum is affected. It is 
a way that we deduce backward what part of the brain is involved. We look at the different type of walking pattern, what's abnormal about it, and we know that there's certain type of walks that are related to different abnormalities in the brain. So with cerebellar issues, we know that the stance, the two legs get really, really wide, okay? And what's interesting is that um, the cerebellum is also the part of the brain that really gets affected with alcohol use. So you can also look to see, uh, next time you see an intoxicated person, look at the way that they're walking. They automatically make their legs wider and that's just because it gives us a little bit more mobility and coordination it's really interesting so the onset of the symptoms um, seem to be different for different people so for some people it starts with sitting to standing for other people as soon as they stand they start to feel the unsteadiness for other people it might take several minutes of standing until they start to feel that very very high wave pressure and tremor like I was saying before OT gets stereotyped as just being a leg tremor. But what I learned from doing this research is that people 74 to 92% of folks with OT also have what we call a postural tremor. And you can figure out if you have this right now. So all that this means is that a person has a tremor when they maintain a position against gravity, like holding out your arm. So you're sitting in your chair right now, just put your arms out in front of you. And if you start to get a little bit of a tremor, that's what we call a postural tremor. We also see that this happens in folks with essential tremor. So this, what's so important to know is that the tremor in OT is actually very hard to see. And this is part of the diagnostic problem. This is why so many people don't get diagnosed, don't get good care, because it's a very high frequency tremor. So when we talk about tremors, we actually talk about it in, in the measurement of, um, of hertz and so all you need to know is that the higher the number the more fast the tremor and the slower the number the the lower the hertz the more visible a tremor is so what we know about ot tremor is it tends to be about 13 to 18 hertz so this literally can very barely and you need a sophisticated trained eye to see this independently just with the human eye, okay? There are a couple tricks that doctors do sometimes use, and so sometimes they actually, um, there's something I thought was interesting, was called the hem sign, which is where if, if it's a woman and they're wearing a skirt, if you actually look at the hem of the skirt, it's easier to see the fabric moving so, 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 so quickly with the OT tremor than it actually is to see it with your eyes. And that's why it's so important that doctors are well trained for this um, because even within movement disorders, this is really unique. And so a lot of times what they do is they actually um, feel the leg muscles and you can feel that slight, slight rippling more than you can see it. And oftentimes doctors also use a stethoscope to listen to the leg triceps, also thought of as the calves. So when doctors listen in the calves, they actually can hear in people with OT a noise that they liken to a faraway helicopter blade. Just very, very, very high frequency kind of a sound. So getting back to the gait thing, we also know that sometimes we might ask people to walk and folks who are in the more advanced stages of OT have trouble with tandem gait. So all that means is that you're asked to go toe to heel and walk over and over again. So again, you can kind of do some of these things at home and you can kind of track your own progression and that's a way for you to take control of your own brain health and kind of have a sense of if things are getting harder and easier for you. Because so much of the trouble with OT seems to be that uh, maintaining stance and um, being steady on your feet, there is a fair amount of traumatic falls that happens for these folks. About 25% of people have a history of traumatic fall with OT. This is a problem in and of itself, but the anxiety that can be related to falls also is a big problem. And we just see that in older folks in general. That is a big under-identified, under-treated, developmentally normal anxiety that when I get in the tub, I'm gonna slip, or maybe if there's ice, I'm gonna slip. And you know, some of it must be because you see your friends and they take a fall on the ice and they're in the hospital and you know, have to go to rehab and some people never come home. A, a broken hip, especially for a woman, unfortunately has a very high rate of um, nursing home placement indefinitely and also death. So it is true, we wanna be very mindful about falls, but what can happen is we can 
become so fearful of falling with OT because literally we don't feel safe in our own body when we're standing that people can start to avoid situations where they have to stand for a long time. So this is like standing at the counter to prepare a meal, standing online at the gr grocery store. So people, it, it, as I'm reading, have learned to compensate by doing things like shifting their weight from side to side, holding onto a chair, a countertop, another person. So in the diagnosis world of OT, there's two ways that it gets sliced. So there's something called idiopathic OT and there's secondary OT. And what that means is idiopathic means OT is the only problem. We don't see that there's any other system that is impaired in the person, kind of stands on its own. Secondary is like, oh, you have a cerebellar tumor that's causing this um, type of a tremor. You have an autoimmune disease, something called a peroneoplastic syndrome related to cancer vitamin deficiencies, a brainstem issue. There's other issues in the brain that can cause the symptoms of OT, which is why it's so important to work with someone who can rule all that out and by default really get you to the accurate diagnosis of having OT. They also talk about OT in a similar way that they do Parkinson's and essential tremor in that there is kind of normal OT and then there's OT plus. And OT plus is kind of a waste basket of like, oh, here's a whole bunch of extra neurological stuff that we're gonna throw in. And a lot of times they refer to it as Parkinsonianism. So I wanted to demystify that concept because I know when I first started out, when I was hearing that word, I was like, okay, it's not Parkinson's disease, but what the heck is Parkinsonianism? Basically, it's a symptom or a combination of symptoms that mimics parts of Parkinson's, but it's not Parkinson's, okay? So there is a slowness that happens in Parkinson's disease. There is uh, stiff muscles. There is difficulty with speaking, dysarthria. And this can happen for a variety of reasons, including some people with OT, but it also, Parkinsonianism can come along with age. It can come along with having been involved with high contact sports for a long time. It can come along with other movement disorders like Lewy body, progressive supranuclear palsy, multi-system atrophy. So one of the things I wanted to know is how am I a practicing neuropsychologist and OT is not something that's on my differential when people who have a tremor uh, complain of a movement disorder. When they come to see me, I'm gonna be totally honest with you. Before I did this research, I don't think it was really on my radar. I really work hand in hand with with movement disorder neurologists to make those diagnoses. So I'd, I'd like to think no one has slipped through the cracks, but I am so grateful to all of you who asked me to do this lecture because honestly, it really has improved my patient care and I'm so grateful for that. The other thing is because there is so little data out there on the cognitive and emotional issues in OT and that's really what neuropsychologists specialize in. So there's so much to learn there. So when I first started, it was like, okay, how many people have this? Well, guess what? Nobody knows. There's no number about how many people have this. People reference this one article from Spain that was done a few years ago that said one out of every 4,000 older adults has OT. I was not very satisfied with that number and you should not be also. Sounds like there's a wide range for the age of onset, but most people seem to develop it around 60. So you tell me if that fits for you. The age of onset though is very wide. So there's been cases as young as 13 all the way up to 85. They think that children and adolescent cases are relatively rare. It appears to predominantly affect women more than men. So the numbers I was getting was like 63 to 76% were women, which is kind of interesting. Um, in one study, the age of onset for primary OT, where it's just an issue that is just encapsulated with o in OT was definitely um, earlier. I also learned that not just human beings get um, OT, orthostatic tremor. There are large breeds of dogs, particularly um, Great Danes and Mastiffs in the United States, Canada, and the UK that have been diagnosed with OT. And that is an important insight because so much of how far we get in brain science, we need animal models for. It's not the nicest thing. And of course we all love our pets and wouldn't want to think about anything like that happening. But maybe that's a way forward in OT is if we can see it in another species, then we're able to study it a little bit better. So how you get diagnosed is simply based on what you tell the doctor, the physical exam, and especially the EMG recording. And I wanted to make sure everyone knew about that because if you're gonna go down this road with OT, you're probably gonna have an EMG. You can raise your hand and let me know if you had one. 
Not the most pleasant experience as far as my patients tell me, but a surface EMG is basically a series of electrodes put on, you know, usually your arms or your legs. And what they're really looking at is the voltage change between one electrode to another. And basically the idea is if they send a current here, they're going to measure how long it takes to actually travel to electrode number two. And muscle cells have very specific ways of behaving when they are healthy and normal. And so what these changes in voltages are allowing us to do is to detect if there's a delay, if there's a lack of activation, and that pattern, that analysis of that pattern is really how we understand what's happening in muscles. So when they do EMG on folks with orthostatic tremor, there's a couple interesting findings. So the first thing is that there is a very, very high intramuscular coherence. And what that means is, let's say most people have their tremor in their calves, right? The back muscles of the leg. It is happening almost exactly the same in the left and the right. And this is something we don't see in a lot of other movement disorders. Many times there's asymmetry. So that's one of the ways we try to differentiate Parkinson's from essential tremor is that we ask people, did it start on your left? Did it start on your right? Does it feel like it was in both hands kind of equally? And PD, Parkinson's tends to be more one-sided. So this is something new uh, for me to learn about OT that there's so much uh, synchronicity, there's so much um, similarity that's happening across both sides of the body. So the Movement Disorder Society is the professional group that kind of tracks and characterizes OT, and they are the ones that have that in their diagnostic criteria that you have to have an abnormal EMG. I also wanted to know about the genetics. Well, guess what? They don't know hardly anything at all. So the vast majority of cases are considered to be sporadic, which can mean either that it just happens out of the blue or it can mean you have a few genes that come to life when a certain risk factor in the environment happens. Now, I could not find one shred of scientific evidence to tell me what the risk factors are for OT. I'm very clear on what they are in ET. This was part of our webinar, heavy metals, pesticides, inflammatory diet, right? We know in Parkinson's that chemicals are a huge source of kind of um, making genes in Parkinson's come to life. I could not find anything on OT which drove me crazy. We do know that folks who um, report a family history, it's only about 5%, but there are case studies where two siblings had it, a set of twins had it, and there was one in which a mother and son had it together. So I would just say, who the heck knows? I don't know. Um, this also gets back to this idea about are people being correctly diagnosed because if it's something that's very hard to see, I think many people could have been misdiagnosed as, oh, grandma always had anxiety, she didn't like to go to the store. Well, maybe it's because she feels very anxious when she's actually standing on her own two feet. So it really complicates understanding family history. Um, in 19, no, pardon me, in 2016 only, only four years ago, the idea that the cerebellum was involved with OT began to be accepted. You guys, that is only four years ago, and that is experts, people who sleep and breathe and eat OT. This is the problem. We need to do such a better job at public awareness because even myself, I mean, I put my hand up. I feel terrible now that I really didn't understand all that this disorder uh, presents to people. And so I want to talk to you briefly about the cerebellum because not only is it absolutely fascinating, but it does so much cognitively and emotionally. And if you don't know it and no brain health doctor has ever validated for you that, yeah, you're not just going to have trouble with balance and movement. You're also going to have trouble with word finding. Your emotions might feel really, really big at times. You can struggle between feeling like, oh my God, i am got all this energy. I can be kind of impulsive. I'm like a bull in a china shop. Or I have two modes. Or I then can be like, I'm on the couch. I can't get it together. I can't make a plan. I can't follow through. Think of the cerebellum as kind of like being in, in charge. There's a couple bosses, but it, the cerebellum is one of the bosses of the gas and the brake that's in our brain, okay? Cerebellum is in the far back there, kind of sits right above the spinal column, the brainstem, and it's fascinating because what it does 
physically for us is what we call ipsilateral. So the left side of the cerebellum controls the left side of the body and the coordination, and the right side of the cerebellum controls the right side of the body and coordination. But once we get into indirect connections in the brain, we actually cross, okay? So then it becomes contralateral. So what I mean by that is the brain is extremely integrated and so many parts of the brain work together. And in the cerebellum, we know that there's kind of like loops. I kind of think of them like rubber bands holding together different parts of the brain. So the connections in the cerebellum are in the frontal lobes, okay, and the parietal lobe, which is kind of our spatial center, and our thalamus, which is responsible for sensory processing, okay? All our senses go through our thalamus except smell before they actually get to the cortex, the processing part of the brain. So when you have trouble in the cerebellum, you're not just gonna have cerebellar issues. This is the big news flash. You're gonna have indirect symptoms, right? So what I mean by that is if you've got a right cerebellum that's giving you trouble, you also are expected to have some degree of left frontal cortex impairment because we know that there are loops in these connections. So it kind of takes that part of the brain offline a little bit. In ET, which I feel like I know very well now, these cognitive symptoms are mild when you read about them in the literature, but guess what? They're not mild if they're happening to you and you're used to your words just flowing out of you beautifully. You are used to fluency of speech. If you can't come up with your words, I'm telling you right now, that's one of the most frustrating things that can possibly happen to you. I also wanted to know what's the progression of OT? Is it degenerative? Does it get worse over time? Well, guess what? We don't really know. Um, if you ask people, it sounds like about 80% of people will say it has gotten worse over time. And 15 years was what I could find for being kind of that line in the sand to when people felt like it started to spread. So that was an interesting thing too. The symptoms did get worse, but the progression was also described as it spread from my legs up to my trunk and into my arm. So I'm telling you guys, I'm still a bit in the dark here. So put your story out here, send me a message on Facebook. I'm, I'm really curious. It's important to me to understand this. So again, these were all based on self reports, but in science we strive for objective measurements, right? So a few years ago, a doctor named Dr. Field got 15 OT people together and all he asked them to do was st stand on firm ground and just walk with their eyes open. And the measurement was how far was their sway path. So what we mean by this is how far off a straight line did they get? And sure enough, the longer people had OT, the harder time they had with actually staying on a straight line. So it does suggest that for some people, this is probably a progressive disorder. However, what I would argue is our understanding and our knowledge of OT is so poor that I don't even feel great about a lot of this research because if you then start to look at people who've been diagnosed with OT, what you also start to see is that there's many subgroups and one study had about 41 people with OT and when they got experts in there, they had been diagnosed by regular neurologists, when they actually got OT experts in there, 10 of them actually had other things. They had Parkinson's, they had, um, uh, focal dystonia, um, people had Parkinsonianism, progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a degenerative brain disease. So it's, it's, it's definitely murky out there. And, and my heart goes out to anyone who's living with this because my God, if, if your expert doesn't even know what the heck, you must feel like you're on your own. So it takes a long time for folks to get diagnosed properly with OT. Um, the studies that I read had 7.2 years was the average seven years to get diagnosed with something that must be absolutely insane. So Marcy, you're just joining us. Yes. So you're helping me understand you can walk fine. It's the standing that's difficult, right? So standing definitely difficult, but um, when they do the kind of scientific psychophysiological measures, what we were talking about is that there is kind of a sway pattern and which kind of like hard to stay on a straight line for some people and also the legs compensating by going out wider. There is an intense debate if OT is OT or is OT an extension of essential tremor? Is it really a variety of diseases? There are some things that are similar between OT and ET and there's some things that are different. So 
before I was letting you know that um, the tremor in OT is very, very high frequency, very fast. That is not the case in essential tremor, so we have a difference there. In essential tremor, alcohol can be a helpful diagnostic tool because we know for many people, especially with the genetic variant of ET, if they take some alcohol, the tremors in the short term get better. We do not see this alcohol effect. We also know that essential tremor responds pretty darn well to propanolol, which is a beta blocker. We don't necessarily see that in OT as much. A lot of folks who have OT um, seem to take uh, benzodiazepines like clonazepam, which have some side effects. At first, they can make you feel really tired. You do adapt to that relatively quickly, but they also have some cognitive side effects. They can make you feel a little bit uh, mentally slow. And unfortunately, over long periods of time, they do increase your risk factor for getting things like dementia. So of course, we want to be very mindful of trying to find alternatives. When I was going through looking at the medications, I came across what sounded to almost be this miracle drug called Parapanel. And I know that some of you who have this know about this research because I did snoop a little bit onto some OT Facebook support groups just quickly to see what people knew and how people were talking. And I was very impressed with the level of education and knowledge in the two groups that I looked at. I mean, I was blown away. And that's kind of why I think I came into this lecture feeling a little bit like, I hope I can offer something because it was a very enlightened group. And so in 2018, all the way up to recently, there's been these case studies. We can't seem to get a quality double blind placebo controlled studies, but they write up these individual people who have OT who take this um, parapanel and they just seem to have these like miracle cures, not only in terms of what they report, but even on the electrophys and the EMG recordings, they're showing very, very little tremor. And for most of these people, the effect is lasting. So it's not like they get a breakthrough with the drug and then it goes away. It seems to actually be holding up. So I was very impressed with that. Obviously the next step there, we need to have a randomized control study to evaluate if there are side effects, if this is something that helps everyone with OT, if it's something that maybe um, you know, only helps a subgroup. I would absolutely love to know if any of you, if, if you feel comfortable, talking to us about taking that medication, it sounded almost too good to be true. So the people who have um, taken that medication in these, in these small studies, it, it, they were reporting that they can stand perfectly fine. The transition into walking was much less difficult and I thought that was pretty um, enlightening. So there are people that do brain surgery for OT um, and when they do this, it's usually the bilateral ventral intermediate thalamic nucleus stimulation. How's that for a mouthful? Um, there has really only been a handful of people that I could um, research who have been through this and for the most part, it sounded like it helped most people. There's also folks who get spinal cord stimulators and that has shown a benefit effect in a few people who tried every medication known to mankind, but nothing really seemed to help them. So in closing, what I feel like I learned from this is what an incredibly frustrating experience it must be to have OT. Um, very poorly understood, probably the most poorly understood neuropsychological disorder that I've ever come across. Um, seems to maybe be a family of diseases. Not everyone fits into the same mold, which is just like ET, which is just like Parkinson's. So really we have to start thinking about these things as being on a spectrum with probably different gene involvement, different risk factors, and, and symptoms just get expressed different. We're all different. Our brains are all different from the get-go. And so it makes sense. Think of us kind of like the prism that the brain disease kind of comes through. It makes sense that it's gonna come out in different ways for different people. There is so much more work to be done to understand um, this condition, what helps, what makes it worse. So much to be done in terms of supporting um, this community. There, um, it really made me think about some of the work we've put forward with Essential Tremor and helping with kind of your own psychological coping and the way that you develop a relationship with your OT. We talked about it in our webinar with ET and I'm gonna talk with Dr. Renfro and we're gonna put our heads together to see if there's something that we could do that we could offer the OT community. So if that's something that you all would be interested in, please let us know here in the comments. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to learn more about OT. Uh, I'm, I'm very committed to learning as much as I possibly can. So if you all can educate me anymore, I would be extremely grateful.
I will be back here next Wednesday talking about something. I don't know what it is right now, but I'll find something to talk about. And if you all thought this was helpful or interesting, I would so appreciate you sharing it. We're trying really hard to grow as best we can on social media because the truth is that's how we're gonna get more power to be able to offer you all more stuff at a free or affordable cost. That is our goal. You guys are so great. I love spending these Wednesdays with you. Thank you all so much. And I hope that you all have an awesome week until I see you again. Bye-bye.